In this episode, I visit the Thuringian Forest, where some of the world's most talented Christmas artisans live and practice their craft. This is a powerful tale of human perseverance, how these craftspeople struggle to create things of beauty in a country once divided, their businesses seized by the communist government, their livelihoods lost, eventually regained, and reimagined. Today, I'm honored and excited to share with you their creativity that survived and thrived. We travel to the villages of craftspeople nestled in the forest of the German state of Thuringia. For centuries, these artisans have been making Christmas decorations that delight and deliver joy around the world. For me, Christmas is most alive in Germany. It's the country that has Christmas markets and generations of artisans creating Christmas crafts and decorations. And this little figurine from Marilyn has a powerful story of one family's dedication to keeping the lost art of paper mache Christmas figurine creation alive through war, through a family business lost and regained. And today it continues to thrive, bringing joy to people around the world. So we're here at Marilyn. This is a company that was founded in 1900 and produces handmade paper mache figurines. It was founded by a man named Richard Marr in 1900 and the name Marilyn actually comes from his secret recipe of paper mache that produces these artistic and highly detailed and very collectible figurines. The Marilyn factory resides in the village of Steinach in the original house of its founder Richard Marr. Today, his descendants run the company after taking it back from the communist government when the Cold War ended. My name is Christian Forkel, like the fork, um, and uh, the founder of the company was my great-great-grandfather. He founded the company back in 1900 and started with the production of uh, nativity figures. For that, uh, he developed a special material. Oh. It's a kind of mixture between an paper mache and a porcelain mm -hmm. and uh, the first molds he did on his on his own on his own and then uh, up to the 1920s um, he developed three four hundred different uh, styles and molds wow. and then uh, around 1920 another artist uh, joined the company uh -huh. the name was uh, Julius Weigelt uh -huh. And then he made uh, the other molds that we use even today. Marilyn craftspeople created early figurines in the Nazarene style, a rustic rendering. Now, when Julius Reichert joined Marilyn, he introduced a more dynamic, detailed, lifelike style of figurine making that requires craftspeople to cast and shape the body separately, then attach by hand the individual arms and legs. So it's all these little surprising connections that I love to make when I travel. I was just in Erfurt, and turns out that they are restoring nativity figures from the church in Erfurt. Look at this. How old are these that you restored? Uh, so these figures are about at least 100 years old. 100 years old. And these were restored by your craftspeople and they will return to the churches in yeah. Erfurt. These are original Marolin figurines and uh, the molds are made by Richard Maurer back around 1910. And uh, the good thing is that we still have the molds for, for instance, for the limbs and uh, the, the smaller parts. So if one of the arms is broken or lost, we can attach a new one. 
Wow. Over the years, Marilene expanded to create not only nativity and religious figurines, but fairy tale characters, animals, and Easter bunnies. The company currently produces more than 2,000 items. The Easter rabbit, Easter bunny, has a long tradition in Germany. It's a very popular product. You can take off the head and fill sweets in, and this Items were given to the children as a present for Easter. So we are in November and you are fast at work on Easter. When did you start working on Christmas? Yeah, immediately in the new year. In 1949, after World War II, the village of Steinach became part of communist East Germany, governed by the Russians in a zone named the GDR, or German Democratic Republic. Marilyn remained a family business producing figurines until 1972, when the communist government forced the family to sell it far below its value in a government takeover of all remaining private companies in East Germany. The figurine factory set dormant until 1989, when the GDR returned privately owned companies back to their original owners. The family applied to get Marilyn back and reopened in 1990. Tell me a little bit about that. Why did you decide to carry on this tradition of craft? <clears throat> yeah, it's a good, a good question. It's a, always a, the thing is, it's a family business, mm -hmm. and uh, the the company was taken away by the communists in uh, the early seventies, nineteen seventies, and then um, my great father. Uh, decided to take back the company when the Berlin Wall came down in uh, 89. And uh, in the following years, we remembered the old production of these paper mache things and found several of these old molds in the, in the, in the cellar. And uh, so we could start uh, bring up this production. You can learn about Marilyn's history in its museum on site at the factory and shop the store for its handmade, hand-painted figurines. People around the globe collect Maryland figurines, and you can find them at some well-known stores during the holiday season. Next, we travel to the village of Lausche, known as the birthplace of the glass Christmas ornament. My exploration of Christmas artisans takes me to the village of Lausche. For centuries, artisans have created mouth-blown and hand-painted glass ornaments. It's a tradition recognized by the Nationwide Register of Intangible UNESCO Cultural Heritage. So here in Lausche, I wanted to take you inside the workshop of one of the local glass-blowing artists. We're going to watch him at work. We're also going to learn a little bit about his craft. He has been making free-form glass-blown ornaments for 40 years now, a skill that requires practice to know intuitively how to read and work with the glass without a mold. how the glass is moving, on which temperature, and so on, and this is, is a skill. His wife paints the glass-blown Christmas ornaments. In the early 1800s, Lausch's first glass workshops opened, taking advantage of the abundance of glass-making materials, including wood and water from the Thuringian forest. Lausche glass Christmas ornaments gained worldwide fame after making their way into Woolworth stores in the 1880s. Mr. F. W. Woolworth discovered Lausche's glass ornaments during a visit to Germany, and he began importing them to sell in his chain of dime stores across the United States. Over the years, Lausche attracted more glass makers, including free-form glass blowers who blow the glass by mouth, creating shapes without using a mold a skill preserved and passed down through generations here. After World War II, Thuringia became part of East Germany and the state took over most of Lausche's glass workshops until the 1990s when Germany was reunited and businesses returned to private owners. What impresses me most is how this craft persevered through generations, wars, and hardships. 
I meet up with a fourth generation glass blower at work, creating 200 ornaments in a single day. So we just showed you how the glass blowing artist created the glass ornament. Now the next step in this process is the silvering of the glass ornament. And this process gives the glass its beautiful glow and dimension and reflects the light and really teases out all its gorgeous angles, shapes, and lines. The glass blower dips the glass ornament in silver nitrate mixed with a reverse osmosis water. So we just discovered the secret to the beautiful silver glass. The color is actually painted from the inside. So step three in the process of creating glass blown ornaments, time to add the lacquer coating. And so we've arrived at the fourth and final step of making a glass blown ornament. Behind me, you can see artists who are hand painting each one of these ornaments. We end our visit to Laosha at the Christmas by Krebs showroom. It's a subsidiary of Christmas by Krebs, one of the largest ornament manufacturers in the USA. After spending the day in Laosha with glass blowers and artists, I gotta say I have a newfound respect and appreciation and admiration for these Christmas ornaments and the labor of love and the heritage and tradition that goes into each one of these. And I gotta tell you on this journey as I film this show and I travel from town to town and meet with different artists and makers, I feel that I'm changing. I feel that I cannot help but make more mindful decisions when I'm shopping in a store, searching for products made with heart and hand, with meaning instead of mass produced, that's going to be my guiding beacon as a consumer, and uh, I think more of us should get out and really experience makers, artisans, and all of their love, time, talent, and attention. Up next, we're going to stay in style at a nearby boutique hotel with an eclectic design story to tell that connects visitors with local culture and craft. For my visit to the Thuringian Forest, I chose to stay at the boutique hotel Shifa Hall. The hotel gets its name from the stone Shifa, which is local to the region. And this is the largest building made of the Shifa stone. Come on inside. It's absolutely charming. I think you're going to love the authentic decor and the warm hospitality. Thank you. I have a room for you. Perfect. Thank you so much. I hope you have a nice time. Oh, we're looking forward to our visit here in the Thuringium Forest. Okay. Hi. Welcome in our hotel. Nice. Welcome in the Christmas country. My name is Lutz. I'm the owner from this hotel and I'm very happy that you are here. Thank you so much for having me. I cannot wait to explore the Thuringium Forest and your hotel is adorable. I love all the Christmas decorations. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Husband and wife team Lutz and Rita Horn own the boutique hotel in the Thuringian Forest, the heart of glass blowers and Christmas decoration makers. The half-timbered slate house was built in 1908 and changed ownership throughout history until 1994 when Lutz and Rita purchased it and turned it into a boutique hotel that intimately connects guests with local artisans through its handmade products and decor including the hotel's glassware made by Laosha glassmakers. Every space is a dance of bright, whimsical colors on the walls, furnishings, and fun lighting that create a playful, happy vibe. 
Each of the hotel room's decor tells a story tied to a theme. So this, this is the fairy tale room. Well, it's magical. I say goodbye to the craftspeople and communities in the Thuringian forest, and I find myself wanting to hold on to the sensory experiences of my travels. The smells of the fresh forest, the smoky fires of the glass blowers, and the paper mache and paint of the Maryland figuring makers. Thuringia, once closed to Western tourists during its years as part of communist East Germany, embraces everyone with a warm welcome. I promise, if you visit, You'll leave with a profound appreciation of the talents, skills, and dedication locals have for keeping traditional handicrafts alive for centuries here. Until the design tourist travels again, stay curious and stay inspired.